In part two of this video series, we're going to discuss the chi-square goodness of fit test. In case you're wondering why there's funky-ass Google spreadsheet graphs on the front title page of this presentation as opposed to sleek-looking R graphs like we usually use, well, it's because at the time of making this video, I'm helping my wife homeschool our three kids, Micah, Pearl, and Eben. And I thought yesterday as a homeschooling activity, we would do a little probability and learn how to make some graphs in Google spreadsheets. So here's what we came up with. Now, the graph on the left is the first experiment we did. I told them all to toss a coin 20 times, which you can see none of them actually did. I think Eben ended up with 21 for some reason. Micah decided to go for 30. And Pearl, who said I needed to say that she did the best of everyone on this experiment, ended up with 40. And when we totaled up their outcomes, we had a total of 91 tosses. And 41 ended up being heads. Okay. So the question here is we know that by chance, you know, about half of all tosses should end up in heads, which half of 40, 91 would be, you know, 45.5. So that's how many we'd expected to be heads, right? So the question here is, is this discrepancy between what we expect and what we observed large enough to kind of convince ourselves that there was some sort of bias involved here? Were they biased towards tails or was this just this difference totally, totally expected under chance? Now, the second experiment they did was to go through their school calendars and to count how many of their schoolmates had birthdays in each month of the calendar year. Now, there was a total of 224 students at their school, and that happened to work out nicely to split up to 19 students per month. So if I drew a line in this graph at 19, that's where you kind of expect everything to be. Of course, not all months have the same number of days. I understand that, but let's just keep it simple and assume this is the case, right? We see that some months, particularly October and December, had much lower than expected birth rates. And some, such as January and July, had higher than expected. So the question is, are those deviations from 19 you know, expected? If you, if you sort of split up these birthdays randomly between the 12 months of the year, would you expect to see deviations as large as we did? These types of questions form the foundation of goodness of fit tests. So the null hypothesis for a goodness of fit test is always that data comes from some null or status quo distribution. In the examples on the previous slide, both of them have the same null hypothesis, which is that the data comes from a discrete uniform distribution. And there's one of those fun random bars popping up on my PowerPoint again. Right. Now, what I mean by uniform distribution, right, is in the heads and tails example, that would mean it's uniform on two symbols, which we could just call 0, 1, right? So we're, we're equally likely to choose a 0, 1 on each toss. And in the birth month example, it would mean that they're uniformly distributed on the months of the year, which we could just represent by the integers 1 through 12. Now, the alternative hypothesis, then, is that the data does not come from whatever null distribution we've specified. And we've actually done some things like this in the class in the past, and we discussed the idea that a test statistic we could use here, which is commonly called the chi-squared test statistic, is to add up the differences between what you observe and what you expect. Okay. Now, if I simply add those up, we're going to come across a problem because the negative and the positive contributions will cancel out. And we'll just get zero, and that's no good. So we want to do something here to convert these to magnitude. And so if I square them, for example, that takes care of that issue. But another issue here is that I want the size of these square deviations to be measured relative to what we'd expect. So I'm going to divide here by the expected counts. And now the reason for doing this, we kind of discussed this idea earlier in the class. For example, if you toss a coin 10 times and get 10 heads, right, then the deviance, the discrepancy between what you observed and what you'd expect is 5, right? Now, if I toss a coin 100 times and I get 55 heads, this is the same discrepancy between what we observed and what we'd expect. But this one seems like it should be much stronger evidence of bias than this one. So dividing by the expected count sort of allows you to normalize by, by, by the numbers.
So, how do we get at these rejection regions? Well, what I did the, for first pass is calculate them via Monte Carlo simulations. So to simulate the, this experiment, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate 1,000 experiments. Now, I was originally aiming for 50, but actually ended up being 91 tosses of the coin. So we're going to simulate 1,000 experiments of 91 tosses of a fair coin. Okay. So this, the important thing here is that we're doing this under the null assumption. Now, once we do that, for each of our experiments, I'm going to calculate a chi-squared value. So that is going to give me a whole curve of possible values, and it's going to end up looking right skewed, as we'll see in a second here. Okay. Right. Now, if I look at this curve and I compute the cutoff for the upper 5%, so whatever this value is, that's going to be the critical value for defining a rejection region, which means if my actual chi-squared value is to the left of that cutoff, okay, so if actual is here, then we're going to fail to reject H0, whereas if the actual is over here, that's going to be the rejection region where we will reject H0. So let me show you how to do that in R before we continue with this video. For our code, we start off by defining the number of tosses we're going to be simulating. And then M equals two is just telling R that we're going to have two possible categories per toss, right? These are the heads and tails possibilities. The reason why I wrote it this way is so we could easily adapt this code to the calendar situation where M is going to be 12 later. Now the expected counts is going to be the number of tosses divided by the number of categories repeated twice, right? Because we want the expected number of heads and tails. And then the actual chi-squared statistic for our test is going to be the sum of the observed values minus the expected squared divided by the expected. For our Monte Carlo simulations, we're going to employ the replicate command like we used earlier in this course. And you'll recall that the first argument of replicate is how many experiments we're going to run. So we're going to do 1,000. We're going to pretend 1,000 other families around the country are doing the same experiment of 91 coin tosses. And then the second part is computing the chi-squared values for each of those 1,000 tosses. And although I'm not going to go into the code in detail here, I'm happy to answer questions about that over office hours later. So after we've done the experiments, we're going to plot the results as a histogram. That's what this first command is doing. The second line is just some options to make the plot look a little prettier. Then we're going to add a line at the 95th percentile. So this is basically defining our rejection region for the test. The quantile function, if you enter a number here between 0 and 1, will spit out the corresponding quantile for a sample of data. And then this last line is going to plot where, our, where my kid's actual chi-squared value lied relative to that. So let's see what the result is. So running this code, we can see that the black line represents the rejection region cutoff. So anything over here would be reject the null hypothesis at a 0.05 significance level. And then anything to the left would be fail to reject. And you can see that our experiment lied well to the left of this line. So there was no evidence that my kids were biased towards tails in their coin flipping experiment. In case you're ever on a desert island and don't have access to R but still need to do this calculation for some reason, you can use a classical result by Pearson, which connects the chi-squared statistic from this video to the chi-squared distribution from the last set of videos. You'll recall that there, the chi-squared distribution arose as a sum of squared IID standard normal random variables. So to make that connection, let's recall that by the central limit theorem, if you do have a random variable x which is binomial with n trials and success probability p, then the ratio of x minus expected value of x, right, n times p is expected value of x, divided by the square root of np1 minus p, which is the sd of a binomial, will converge in distribution to a standard normal as n goes to infinity. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply this result to our coin tossing example. So we're going to assume that x here is the number of heads, although it doesn't really matter if you do heads or tails. And under the null hypothesis, we know that x will be binomial with n trials and success probability 1 half. 
So if x, little x, is the number of heads in, is the observed number of heads, excuse me, in a specific experiment, then I also know that n minus x will be the observed number of tails. And I also know that both categories will have expected counts of n over 2. So switch into black, back in black. If I want to compute my chi-squared statistic, I'm going to have to look at the observed number of heads minus the expected number of heads squared divided by the expected number of heads plus the observed number of tails minus the expected number of tails squared over the expected number of tails squared. So you'll notice, though, that the second quantity here, the numerator is exactly the same as the numerator for the first. Uh, you will get a difference of a minus sign, but when you factor out a negative 1 squared, that just becomes positive 1. So I can rewrite this as 2 times x minus n over 2 squared divided by n over 2 which simplifies, although I guess simplify is a sort of relative term here, I guess, because this may be more complicated in some ways, simplifies to x minus n over 2 squared over n over 4. Now, why do I want to write it in this way? Well, if we go back up to our central limit theorem result, and we square both sides, on the right, the answer is a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom, as we saw in our last set of videos. But on the left, if I plug in p equals 1 half, notice that what we get is x minus n over 2 squared in the numerator. And in the denominator, we're going to get square root of n over 4 squared, which is just n over 4. And you can see that matches up exactly with our chi-squared statistic. So yay, now we have something in hand that we could use and, and we wouldn't have to simulate, we can just choose our critical values right, based off of the chi-squared distribution. So for example, if I want a, if I want to perform my test at the usual 0 0.05 significance level, I would just use the q chi-squared command in R, okay, q chi-squared, and I would put as my first argument 0.95 that would be the cutoff we want, and then the degrees of freedom, which is 1 in this case. And when you do that, you should end up getting 3.841, which was fairly close to what we saw in our simulations. We had around 4, it looked like, in the graph. And also note that this was much greater than our actual chi-squared value, the the one that we saw from our experiments. So I'll put chi-squared observed here, right? And so our, our conclusion again would be, we fail to reject the null. And it seems like my kids were being fair in their coin tossing and their distribution of heads versus tails. Now, a more general result than this applies in the situation of birth months, or in fact, any time when you're testing against a uniform, discrete uniform distribution. And this is, sort of a more general version of the chi-square goodness of fit test. So suppose we wish to test the hypothesis, the null hypothesis that the data comes from a uniform 1 through m distribution right, versus the alternative that the data does not come from this distribution. Think of the parameter m here as the number of possible outcomes or the number of categories. So for the coin tossing, it would be 2. For birth months, it would be 12. Then what Pearson's result states is that for large n, the distribution of the test statistic observed minus expected over expected right, is approximately chi-squared with m minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now, why the m minus 1, you might ask? Well, if you recall on the previous slide, flip back for a moment, that was a situation where m was 2. And you'll notice that the last term in our chi-squared statistic, we were able to simplify it in terms of the first because of the fact that the number of tails is defined by the total number of trials and the number of heads. This turns out to be the case no matter how many categories you have. You can always rewrite one of the categories, one of the m categories, in terms of the other m minus 1, and hence you lose a degrees of freedom, degree of freedom from doing so. So that's why you always end up with number of categories minus 1 here. Now applying this to the birth data from our experiment, so back to birthdays, 
my daughter, I, she, you know, I told her I would tell you again that she did the best job and stuck with this the longest. She painstakingly entered this first column of observed counts into a spreadsheet. I later went back and calculated the expecteds, which were all 19. And in fact, I'll note that I made a silly calculation error in the first slide of this video. 224 divided by 12 is not 19. It was actually 228 divided by 12. So forgive my corona brain in that scenario. And then for each of these categories, what we can do is we can compute the chi-squared. So this is just, you know, 23 minus 19 squared over 19, for example, and so on down the list. And you can see that, sure enough, the biggest contributions, the biggest discrepancies between observed and expected were from October and December. And overall, we ended with a chi-squared statistic of 4.84. Now the degrees in this free, in this example, the degrees of freedom was 12 minus one, right? Number of categories minus one. So looking at the critical cutoff, we got a value of about 19.67, which is definitely greater than our observed. And hence, once again, we failed to reject the null and concluded that birth months at my kid's school was not biased towards any specific month, or, or at least it would appear so based on the data. So in our third video from this series, we're going to show how to apply this sort of reasoning when fitting continuous distributions by binning data according to quantiles. So we hope you'll return for that one as well.